So I think it's really interesting in, in Silicon Valley, you hear a lot of people saying that they have just replaced Google search with perplexity. They're only searching on perplexity now, which is generative AI search. Do you think, is that like a Silicon Valley bubble thing, or are people doing that elsewhere around the country, around the world? Like, how many daily actives do you have now? Yeah, it's not just a Silicon Valley bubble. Uh, we have lots of users, even in states outside Silicon Valley. We have a lot of users um, outside the United States, too. So I'm not sure how many of the other users have completely replaced Google with perplexity, but there are lots of users. And our core positioning is that you don't have to replace Google with perplexity for benefiting from perplexity. You can use both these tools. Google can be used as a web navigator. Like, if you just want to get immediately to r slash Wall Street bets, you know, just go to Google and type that, you, you get onto the subreddit immediately. But if you actually want to know, like, what's going on with the specific stock, or why did it decline today, or like, what's the latest news about the Google employees protesting in their office and getting fired, like, all these kind of like, actual questions you actually want to, like, get an answer for, uh, that's where perplexity excels and Google is not like meant for that sort of a usage. So when people say they completely replaced Google with perplexity, what they mean is like what they want a search engine to do for them is just answer questions. Um, and they view anything else as just like a browser. So a typical search engine that just gives you links is kind of subsumed in the search bar of your browser. Uh, you, so, if, so that part is not getting replaced by perplexity. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, anything where you actually have to go to Google.com and like do your research, your actual workflow where you're like opening a bunch of sites, reading a bunch of paragraphs, trying to arrive at a conclusion about something, that is better served by an answer engine that just answers your question directly. Yeah. Do you? Um, so you, I met you maybe what like two years ago or something was it? I and I one like, year. One year. Was it about a year ago? Because perplexity yeah. itself is not two years old yet. <laughs> so it's kind of, it goes by so fast. <laughs> so um, you, I remember you talking about Jeff Bezos, and you're kind of like a student of his management yeah. style. He's now a big investor in yeah. perplexity. Yeah. What was that like? Like, what did you talk about with with Bezos and as yeah. in the lead up to that? I mean, when when we met Bezos, uh, the way it, it was just like you know how you'd expect. You would be asked to write a memo, and then um, not like a one pager, like a four to six pager, and then he would actually read it and come prepared to the meeting. And even at you know, even after achieving so much, and even though he's not actually you know involved or running in our co company or anything like that, uh, he still wants to be in the details and wants to understand. Um, I think like we like like. He, he understands, and like, like a lot of his old wisdom is how we are positioning ourselves right now. Uh, if you remember, there's a whole viral video of his, the 1999 interview, when, pe when the interviewer keeps asking him, are you just a pure internet play? And he's like, internet, internet doesn't matter. What matters is the customer experience, right? It's the same thing that's repeating now. Everybody's like, are, you're just a GPT rapper. Like, GPT rapper, Claude rapper, Mistral rapper, Llama wrapper doesn't matter. Like what matters is you get accurate answers at blazing fast latency in a user-friendly app. That what that's what matters. And if we deliver on that we, and and scale our users to basically every person in the planet, uh, we will succeed. Doesn't matter if you're a rapper or not. So I think he he resonates a lot with that positioning. And um, and then the other part is your margin is my opportunity. You know like like. Google has such a huge search advertising business margin to protect, and giving answers directly means people click on links much fewer times, and therefore it's not in their best interest to go accelerate and build this other product out, and that opens up an opportunity in the innovator dilemma. Yeah. Setup. By the way, I don't know if everybody here knows this term rapper, which has become like the ultimate insult in the tech industry to be called a rapper, where you're basically you know using um, ChatGPT or some other foundation model, you know, API, and just kind of like put, plugging it into your own interface. Um, and you, but you actually came from OpenAI, so you left. I think it was what like two months mm -hmm. before the launch of ChatGPT. Did you not, see not the, too, uh, quite quite a, 
Was bit it longer. more than that? Yeah, okay. but my times are time but yeah, are off uh, today. When I was there, um, you know, like there was nothing. There was a version of ChatGPT internally built with much less capable models. It was not really fun to use, and um, GPT-4 training was going on, but things were not looking that great. And this is sort of uh, you know stuff you learn with experience that like these things actually take time, and there'll be a lot of mistakes made along the way. And uh, if you kind of judge based on the current situation, then you might make like you know a wrong estimate about a company. Um, and but at that time, there were companies that were building on top of GPT-3 or 3.5. Uh, or Codex, like all these are models that OpenAI built, but companies like Copy AI or GitHub Copilot were all like making a lot more revenue than OpenAI itself by using their models and building great user-facing products like coding assistants or marketing copy assistants and so on. So it was very clear to me that it, AI has transitioned from a research phase to a product phase, which is an amazing time to go start a company. Uh, deeply grounded in AI, where like you can reimagine products from ground up, right? Uh, but I did not imagine that OpenAI will build a first-party product on their own. Uh, that will also be revolutionary. In fact, like way more revolutionary than any of these products, um, which is which ended up being ChatGPT. You, you've been sort of critical of the, the, these attempts to sort of put guardrails on the language models themselves and make them sort of what critics might say woke, or you know, you saw what happened with, with Gemini, I think they were talking about that on the previous panel. Um, so why is it, what, why, why do you think that's a bad idea to kind of rein these, these models in? Because we're here in Washington where the, a lot of the discussion is, mm -hmm. how do we rein these things in? Yeah, so the, the re, the, like, I don't think it's generally, a, I'm not saying like zero guardrails, I'm just saying guardrails are, uh, like we over-index a lot on them. And uh, one example is like a prompt, like how to make a bomb in the first set of rollouts of these chat LLMs would be like, oh, I'm not, as an AI language model, I'm not supposed to respond to such queries. But then you can actually get YouTube videos, although you go to Google search and type like bomb, making bomb, you just get a ton of results. And we've never regulated Google or YouTube, right, for, for, for providing search results to these queries. And also sometimes you might just be scientifically interested, like, you know, Oppenheimer made a bomb, right? Like, it's not like, uh, you know, you, you, you might be very curious, like how, it, in fact, a whole movie has been made on it. And so would you say that movie shouldn't be released? Uh, so there are some things that you have to decouple from scientific curiosity uh, versus like saying, oh, that can be used to harm the world. And um, only if you know how people can do harm, you can actually go and block it. So. Having a tool that educates users is not a bad idea. As long as the tool goes a step further and says, look, this is purely being answered for your curiosity or educational reasons and like not meant to, like, you know, you, you should be careful of what you're doing. And, and I think that's the right way right, to think about product building. Even like YouTube has a like lot of videos about so many arbitrary things. And, and if, if we regulated AdWords or AdSense where people bid on some keywords and you know, any site could get ranked up, uh, there was no protection at that time, right? Like, but we only because we built all this and built the guardrails along the way, we could create so much market cap and economic value in, in this country. So not doing that for AI would be a big mistake. So you're, you're competing with Google for search, and the way Google works is you search for something, and they serve you an ad based on usually what you searched for. Mm -hmm. um, you told me, I think, what, maybe six months ago or something, that you didn't think that in this generative AI era of search that ads was necessary or the right method. And I think, but I think now you've said maybe you will, you will serve ads under circumstances. So I'm just wondering, like, does your vision of the ad-free search industry ecosystem still exist? Do you still think that's the future? Is ads just like a stop along the way? Yeah. So. I think like what, what I said is we should not use advertising to influence the correctness of an answer. What links are being used to give you an answer should not be influenced by advertisers trying to bid up and get their websites being used for the answer. Uh, or the, the answer itself should not be influenced by the advertiser. Um, 
And, and um, if we can ensure that, then we'll always serve the mission of, you know, like, like, like serving accurate, reliable answers to everybody, regardless of what happens in advertising. Um, Google was started with the same ideals, but in, instead, like, the 10 blue link ranking is what determines, like, what is true knowledge. And uh, if the correct link is hidden beneath the ads, it's, it sort of destroys the purpose. In perplexity, we feel like there are, think about perplexity, the whole product, as like a rich, fertile land, right? It's a useful product. Like a lot of users are coming there every day, so there's a value for the land itself. When there's a value for a land, you come and build construction you know, buildings there. And think about those buildings as ads. But that land is valuable because there's a lot of people in it, there's a lot of nature in it, and you want to preserve that. Nature is like the accuracy part. So if you just destroy all the vegetation and build huge buildings, uh, just so that you, know, you get a lot of money from people paying for it, that's what ends up becoming Google. But if there are a few buildings around, it's not really you know, changing the scene much. Like say hotels in Hawaii are there, right? That doesn't mean Hawaii is, like, has gone bad. So I think if we can do something like that, uh, we can succeed. And we have ideas on which part of the product, like for example, uh, at the end we suggest related questions. Uh, after, a, after an answer is being read, there are questions that are being suggested at the bottom. Uh, we can influence you to ask questions related to somebody who's yeah. bidding for like, you, know, you knowing more about them. And, and you still make the decision of clicking on that. Uh, and, and, and that could be like under the influence of advertising. And, and even that, we can offer you a version that will not, never be under the influence of advertising, but you pay a little bit, right? So the reason we do want to do advertising is because it is one of the highest margin businesses ever built in, in history of capitalism. Yeah. Um, so the, the average revenue per user in the subscription uh, world is much lower, like $20 a month is for the user, and a lot of them are not paying, right? So the average revenue is much lower than 20. Meta reported that the average revenue per user in the United States is like $250. Yeah. Google makes even more advertising revenue than Meta. So assume that it's going to be even more than 250. So we're talking of like 10 to 20x difference here. Uh, so if you want your business to really grow and be, really be profitable, otherwise you'll always be fundraising, right? So you have to do advertising. Do you that you charge this $20 a month uh, fee for you know the pro version? Yeah. Do you also kind of makes me wonder: Is there? Do you think there's revenue maybe in in enterprise or anything along those lines? Yeah, definitely. A uh, ev- lot of people. Tell me, you know, Microsoft has banned perplexity for all their employees. Uh, I said, this is real, I'm not kidding. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, like, a lot of people tell me that uh, their companies don't let them use perplexity during work because they're afraid that you would upload some internal data or, like, in your prompt, you would leak some internal email or, like, something like that, right? Um, a roadmap, and it all goes to us. So. Definitely just to, but that said, like it's so obvious that you would benefit from a tool like this during your work. So let's fix this problem for you and your employer, uh, allow you to use perplexity while you're in the workplace without worrying about your data leaking to us. So the, in regular perplexity, when you use it, you can still turn off AI data usage and we're not gonna use your data. But if you want another level of security and compliance that your employer trusts and more than just you, uh, you need a version of perplexity that can run on your enterprise, and we are working on that. So that's something that will come out yeah. in, 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 on, on the product roadmap? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. And I also wanted to, if we have like a little more time, like your, your vision, I mean, back to like how this ultimately will work, is what you might use perplexity and say, use it almost like an agent where you might buy something, you might, it might buy something for you or yeah. order your pizza and have it delivered or something like that. How, yeah. How's that gonna work? What, what needs to happen on the back end for that to, yeah. to happen? So the number one blocker for agents right now is a model that's very, very capable of reasoning and ability to handle failures, ability to handle a lot of corner cases and string together many small decisions to make an eventual outcome successful. Now, take a simple example. You start searching on perplexity for like what coffee, like, like, like what pizza to order in DC, right? And you, re- you get a bunch of reviews of different places. You decide like there's one place. And say, okay, order me a cheese pizza for like uh, maybe like two boxes for like, you know, five people. 
uh, from this particular place to arrive at this time here, I'm in this location. Now what the agent has to do is take all that information you gave in the prompt, uh, go to that website and like enter, like figure out where exactly to enter these details, uh, enter the details carefully and place the order. Now every website is designed differently, like it keeps changing every day, the designer of the website keeps changing every day, how it, how it is on the phone, how it is on the web, all that changes, sometimes like they might manually call you to confirm the order. These are all like corner cases, right? And, and then like sometimes the person delivering the order is like not even like knowing exactly where to come and you still have to be on your phone. Oh yeah, no, no, come here, come here, guide them. Sometimes they may not speak your language. There's just all sorts of corner cases to handle that you might be like, damn, I wish I just ordered it myself, right? Uh, so that's the problem with the AI, AI agent today. And we need to address this step by step. Identify small things that can be automated there need to be some humans in the loop for sure. Uh, this is where there's opportunity for startups because like uh, startups can figure out ways that are riskier, make some mistakes. For a bigger company, let's say Google has a shopping agent and you know the order is like said it's like done, but someone else gets your order instead of you, right? You would go mad at Google. For perplexity, you're like, yeah, whatever, the startup made a mistake, but it's fine. <laughs> They're trying some new things. So that, that's where I think like, we have an opportunity at the agents game. That's great. Well, I can't wait to order a pizza through perplexity. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. This Thank is great. You.